thank you for your patience while we arrange ourselves in this beautiful room. Um, it's quite inspiring. Um, and thank you for coming to this second long day of this wonderful Athens Democracy Forum, which allows me to thank Achilles again for all his work in organizing this, running it, funding it, uh, making it worthwhile for all of us. So I just had a moment to thank you for that, Achilles. I'm Steve Erlanger with the New York Times, and um, here we're going to talk about the complicated problem of Poland. Uh, Poland is a crucial country in Europe. It has a history that I think most countries would not wish for. Um, it has suffered in every direction, but has come into a new sense of identity, perhaps, uh, re of renewed sovereignty, and also of a certain kind of um, feeling that the structure of the European Union that it joined does not necessarily fit the Poland that it wants to be. It's a divisive question. Um, but we have a very, very good panel to discuss it. To my left, I'm very honored that Vera Jourova is here. Um, Czech-born, uh, significant European commissioner um, who's dealt with Poland, Hungary, now is in charge, if I get this right, in these strange titles that you all have, the Vice President for Values and Transparency. Though you seem pretty solid to me right now. <laughs> and next to Vera is Karolina Vigura, who is a Pole and uh, a very important public intellectual in Poland, a uh, member of the board of Kultura Liberalna, Foundation and a lecturer at Warsaw University. And next to her is Jasza Munk. I'm not sure what to say about Jasza Munk, except he has made quite an impressive name for himself as a thinker, as a writer about democracy, as someone who thinks very hard about Germany, about Poland, about Europe, and even about American democracy. So I'm Jasza, uh, welcome to you. So, Having set the stage, um, I would like Vera to go first. Just try to explain to us um, the challenge Poland represents, but perhaps the opportunity as well for a European Union that is always in flux. Madame Jourova, please. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Indeed, as the Vice President said, this is a holy place. And for my work, and you said yourself that this is special portfolio I have, values and transparency, for my work I need impulses uh, to be able to do the job. I need some, some uh, injections of, of uh, uh, new ideas. And I, I had three. Uh, last year I was in Gdańsk, and I met Lech Walensa and the people of Solidarność, and uh, I felt uh, the desire of people in Poland to have democracy and uh, also to value the rule of law. And recently I was in Lviv in Ukraine and I saw the people, I heard the people who were telling me we are ready to suffer and die for peace and democracy. And I realized that in European member states I don't often hear such uh, wishes and such desire because we got used that this is automatic. This is something given, and it's not. The Polish case, and I know you wanted me to speak about Poland. When Poland started the, the judiciary reform in 2015, I have to say it was a big uh, alarm at the beginning. From the beginning, it already lasts several years. There are serious issues in, in judiciary, also uh, in the field of, of media. And I have to say that I would call it a bitter Polish medicine we received. 
uh, something which made us to think about, can this happen everywhere else in Europe? That's why we started to protect the principle of rule of law much better in the EU. And uh, if, if you want, I can go to this general uh, general uh, matter how, how we protect uh, the protect rule of law by different means. Coming back to Poland, I sometimes hear that this is ideological fight from the Commission side. It's not, uh, because I believe that uh, conservatives and liberals uh, can uh, and should protect the rule of law principles uh, as a universal principle, that this is not ideological matter. Uh, we are uh, in a constant dialogue with the Polish representatives. Uh, we uh, uh, are very consistent as the Commission. We want, if I simplify that three things, uh, to look into how uh, the constitutional tribunal is set up and works. We already have the judgment of the European Court of Justice which says that there are doubts around the uh, legality of this court. We are watching at the National Council of Judiciary as the body which has the key word in nomination and appointing of the, of, the, of the judges. And we are looking into the disciplinary regime. And it's already a, a costly uh, exp uh, exercise for, for Poland because the disciplinary regime was already uh, uh, also contained in the, in the ruling of the EC, uh, European Court of Justice. And there are penalties which Poland already is paying. So, uh, we are focusing on, on these uh, three things mainly, if I simplify that, and we are imposing continuous pressure. When I say we, I mean the Commission, uh, and the Commission doesn't have the final word, fortunately. We have also the rule of law principle at the European level, so we only have preventive tools in our hands in case some decision needs to be taken. We have to refer it to the European Court of Justice through infringements or to the uh, member states. And here I have in, in, in mind uh, Article 7, where Poland is being discussed already several years, and the member states uh, should have the final word or have the final word whether there will be some sanction in uh, 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 addressing the systemic breach of rule of law and newly the conditionality principle, which mm -hmm. can uh, deprive the country of some money. This mm -hmm. is also in the hands of the, of the member states. Mm -hmm. I know I speak no, no, too it's long. Okay. No, no, it's okay. Please. Uh, last word about the last word, because the, la the first and last word is being said by the citizens in the country. So very often I hear you, the Commission, have to do more. You should be stronger, you should impose sanctions and, and uh, increased pressure on Poland, also on Hungary. And I will always defend the right of the people in the countries, in the member states, because they are sovereign powers and we have to respect their free choice in case we still have free and fair elections. Mm -hmm. It's another story. So I have to mention the power of the people. We speak about democracy. We speak about democracy in this church <laughs> of democracy. Uh, when I look at the pictures here, I would like to remind us of the principle of democracy, that the elected politicians do not have the mandates from the gods. Thank you. But from Nanda. the people. Yes. And that was my message. Great. <laughs> Um, Article 7 has been a complete failure. It conditions no one. The Hungarians have promised they would defend Poland from any Article 7. Not only Poland. Not only Poland, exactly, precisely right. Um, nobody wants it. No nation really wants that kind of sanction. So conditionality, you and Didier Renders have kind of tried to figure this out. Is that working? I mean, is the promise of withholding money working, or are the fines still piling up in a way that frankly makes you wonder, given that there is an election coming in Poland next year? Yeah, I, I don't, don't want to occupy the, the whole space here, but uh, Article 7 is not a failure. It is working as a process. 
continuous pressure and very difficult moment for the member states and for Poland and Hungary. It is always a very strange atmosphere there and it's visible that they would like to go home and not to deal with that. That's the atmosphere, but the continuous pressure is there. The, the result might be depriving the member state of the voting rights. And uh, the thing, uh, or the, the condition that you need unanimity, it's a strong factor, but also a complicating factor. But at the same time, it, it shows that the Lisbon Treaty and the legislators did not count with the situation. Yeah when the, there will be such a big backsliding of democratic principles and rule of law that one country will tear, turn with the back against the others and will start betraying the club. And here I don't speak about Poland. And so the lack of imagination of the legislators is now something which is uh, kind of blocking us to do more. You ask about conditionality, this is about the protection of money. This is not about the protection of rule of law so much. And I said uh, uh, at the beginning, when I came with, with this idea in 2017, I said that maybe those who do not understand the values will understand the money. So we are now applying conditionality on Hungary. Hungary is uh, working on uh, addressing the mm -hmm. issues which we enumerated and we will see whether the pressure will bring uh, fruit. Thank you very much. Um, because one of the things that fascinates me is, you know, basically Hungary has always obeyed the European Court of Justice. They, they've always bent in the end. Yes. They've changed their laws, not always very much, but they've always adjusted. Poland, not so sure. Carolina, go ahead. Thank you so much, Steve. And at the same time, thank you also for having me here. I thought, uh, listening to your introduction, that I will comply and I will try to be the personification of the complicated case of Poland. Um, in the Greek theater, there were all, all, always those very strong characters with very strong facial expressions. So I will be the complicated Poland. Now, um, I think I'm, I'm very grateful for, for what Ms. Jourova does, not only for the Polish rule of law, but also for the rule of law in the EU as such. And I'm also very grateful that you have mentioned Ukraine, because it seems that in Europe, the Ukrainians are the only nation that are capable and ready to defend uh, European values with their own lives. And I think it's crucial because they're not a member of the EU yet. So it's a paradox, right? And I think that, that Ukraine uh, poses such a wonderful example of hope for us. And I do believe it's extremely important. For my complicated self, it's also very important because we used to be the source of hope. Poland used to be the source of hope. Our wonderful democratic transformation, our wonderful breakthrough in 1989 was a source of hope. So what happened? How did we prove to be such a disappointment? When, let, let me talk about it a bit. I think this all starts with the myth of Enas. As you know, Enas was the Greek hero who left Troya and he was traveling for a very long time in order to find a place to find and build a new city. And I do believe this is exactly what we have been doing after 1989 in Poland. We departed from somewhere and we started to travel in order to build the new house of democracy and rule of law. So what happened on the way? How did we become this, this, uh, this disappointment? I think that we should uh, perhaps revert the question. Let's say that our democracy is much more full of flaws right now. We have made so many mistakes and the executive have been privatizing the, um, the other institutions of the state. The, uh, the rule of law has been privatized basically by the executive. But we can revert the question and ask how is it possible that actually Poland has been also resilient to this autocratization episode. I think it's extremely crucial here. Because if 
the European Court of Justice and Ms. Jourova are capable of working with the Polish rule of law, it's thanks to the citizens and thanks to citizens' organizations that are actually capable and ready to defend the Polish rule of law from inside. I think it's extremely crucial. So you can say that, of course, there are many things that we have to do to have to revert, have to repair, but at the same time, the Polish I will risk to say that the Polish polarization proves also to be one of the forces that defends democracy in this respect. A question is, of course, what happens after election with the polarization. But, but perhaps we should reinterpret the myth of Enas and say that we perhaps haven't built the house yet. Perhaps we are on the way. Perhaps we are still traveling. And it's not only about the rule of law, it's also about our identity. So first, we have been so much enchanted with the West. We wanted to copy and rebuild the Western model. Then we went into this phase of problems with identity and perhaps also saying no to everything that was Western and connected with the European uh, idea of the rule of law and democracy. But now I think we have a chance to reinterpret our identity within the European frames. This is very important. And let me just an end uh, um, with one more remark. Conditionality, I think, is one thing, but I do believe that the war is another thing. The war in Ukraine has caused Poland and the Polish people to act differently than they have been acting throughout the past seven years. Let's, let's start with the uh, embracing of several million of Ukrainian refugees. I think it's extremely important and of course, I'm not trying to argue, I will not argue, that the government in Warsaw is going to become liberal democratic just because they have these refugees now or that because the, the war has happened or is, is happening. Of course not. They have not become liberal democrats overnight, but to some certain extent they will have to think how to integrate those people, how to live with them, and so I believe they will make some steps to make the conflict with the EU and Brussels lower, they will, uh, smaller, they will have to do it. So if you ask me if it's a black sheep of Europe, I would say, well, it's, it's not become a white sheep, but perhaps a zebra. So sometimes we do it right, sometimes we do it wrong, but it's better than it was. Maybe it's just dirty gray. Perhaps it's, it's, a, it's a gray sheep. That's it's a gray right. Sheep. If, if I can just ask you, I mean, the complication, I covered Solidarność in Poland. I interviewed Lech Wałęsa in Gdańsk. It cost me a carton of Dunhills. That was the price of an interview with him at the time. I was there under martial law. I, too, am rather disappointed. But I do want to press you on this question of history and identity. And, and you've referred to it. But I've also spent a lot of time in northeast Poland, where law and justice is very popular. And why is it popular? It's not just because they give money for more children. Uh, it's because they've embraced the suppressed history of the Soviet occupation, of the deportations which happened in Poland as they happened in Estonia and other places, something that Solidarność wasn't very interested in. And I, I wonder whether, as you talk about Poland moving toward its zebra, status, whether it's coming to a better consensus about its own complicated history? Mm -hmm. um, not yet. Not yet. Two things uh, should be said here. First, uh, we believed in the past 30 years, I would risk, that there is something as Central and Eastern Europe. And we even tried to convince other nations and intellectuals and politicals, politicians that one should speak about Central and Eastern Europe and not Eastern Europe. Somehow we thought that this Eastern adjective was not a very nice one. <laughs> but look at the, at the consequences of the war in Ukraine. Basically Central and Eastern Europe ceased to exist because we see how different the the, the, the reaction to the war is according to the historical perspective. So suddenly Poland became a part of a new entity, Eastern Europe, in which you have also Ukraine, but also the Baltic states. 
This is, this is the neighboring countries of, of, of Russia that have experienced Russian imperialism coming over and over and over again. And so, uh, and so we are very much uh, shaped by this. In this respect, the curious um, alliance between Warsaw and Budapest is over, at least for some time. And I think it's also extremely important if we talk, talk about democracy. So this is one thing. Also, when you ask about the past and identity, um, there is also a source of a bigger discussion. Because as for our fear of Russia, here we are basically not polarized, which is very strange for this country. We're all thinking the same. We're all equally afraid of, of Russia, and we are equally, in contrary to the West, we think this is already a, a war. We are at war. So this is, I think, very important. Here we are not polarized. But as for identity and past, I think we will have to make some more work in the coming years or, de or decades, because the law and justice government has changed profoundly the way we, we, were, we were meant to think about the past. Mm -hmm. So after 1989, our idea for the politics, uh, politics of history was that we embrace all the four roles that we have played in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. The victims, the heroes, the perpetrators, and the bystanders. Mm -hmm. And what the law and justice done, they basically started to convince Poles that they were all, only the victims, victims and the heroes. This is, why, this is because populism is not a kind of politics which is based on values and challenging morally the society. It's basically a kind of politics which is based on defining groups of voters and pleasing them in order to make them vote for you. So Experience some of this trying to cover the scandal of Yadvabne when no poll would ever agree that it had ever been a perpetrator of anything. And, and this feeds into what you're talking about. This is complicated discussion. We go on all day. I'm sorry. Yasha. Yasha, who um, I will rely on for his, for his Hegelian synthesis <laughs> of this conversation. But let's go back to democracy, if, if we can. And, and when you look at, let's say, the victory, apparent victory of Georgia Maloney, it could be Hungary, Poland have another ally inside the European Council. Um, is to, and there are elections coming. So is Poland on the verge of another democratic revolution? Or what, what, what do you think? Or, or does it represent a consistent danger to rule of law? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. This has been a great conversation so far. Um, so Mr. Robert spoke about the lack of uh, imagination that Europe had when it was designing the Lisbon Treaty and when it was designing the European institutions. And I think that's true not just within the European Union, but within the democratic world more broadly. Uh, even at the time that the first of these uh, democracy fora was held here in Athens 10 years ago, the idea that democracy might come under serious threat, not just in some of the fledgling democracies around the world, uh, and some of the recently established democracies around the world, those starting to be the first voices of concern about what's going on in um, Hungary at the time, people were concerned about what was going on in Turkey already, but the idea that democracy might come to be threatened in the United States, in, in France, in Italy, um, seemed absurd. And I know that because I was trying to make the argument at the time, I was just starting to make the argument that there was some very concerning signs about the democratic stability even in the heartlands of democracy and people looked at me to use another ancient uh, analogy um, like I was Cassandra, um, just you know, raving crazy things. And I kept wanting to say, but Cassandra was right, damn it, you need to go back and read the mythology. Um, so I think we're still trying to work out the consequences of our uh, failure of imagination. Um, and so I want to say 
two small points, and then I'll, I'll try just that Steve, you know, because I do what Steve tells me, uh, I'll try the Hegelian synthesis or something along those lines. Um, so, so, so one small point is that we've been talking a lot about uh, Central Europe or Central and Eastern Europe for this conversation, or Eastern Europe in this conversation, but of course we're talking about a phenomenon that goes well beyond Central or Eastern Europe. Um, we're going to have a Prime Minister, Giorgia Meloni, in Italy within a few days, if everything goes as is expected. Uh, we may have a President Le Pen, Marine Le Pen, in France in four or five years. We may have uh, uh, populist uh, prime ministers and presidents in just about any European country. It is very hard to predict which country will go through the kind of political crisis which gives an opening to those populist leaders who are willing to undermine democratic institutions. And so we need to open our imagination to the fact that no country is safe from the kinds of developments that uh, my co-panelists have been describing in Poland and, 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 and in Hungary. Uh, the second point is that this is a, a fundamental problem for the European Union. And I'm afraid to say this is a point where I disagree. It's a much more fundamental problem for the European Union uh, than my colleague has acknowledged. Because the precept of the European Union is that those of us in this room who are citizens of a EU country share their sovereignty with citizens of other EU democracies because we share a set of values and it is very hard for us to deal with a set of common challenges um, within our own countries. This is something that's always been difficult to explain to the citizens. Some citizens have always said, you know, I'm German or I'm Italian or I'm Greek. Why should I be sharing my sovereignty with people in France or people in Spain? But it was possible to explain it because people understand if you try and explain it uh, that there are common challenges like climate change or uh, like uh, the need for single currency and so on that we can only solve by having some form of shared sovereignty. But that whole story becomes incoherent and in fact it becomes mendacious when you're asking citizens not to share their sovereignty with citizens of another democracy, but with subjects of a dictator. And that is essentially where we have gotten in Hungary. It is where we may get to in Poland, and I think Carolina is right that we haven't gotten there yet, and there's some hope for resilience, but it is certainly a danger. And we may get there in any number of other European countries over the course of the next years. And that poses some immediate challenges for governance. It poses challenges about what uh, you know, a country like Hungary can do when it says we're going to veto any Article 7 proceedings and perhaps we're going to try and veto any budget we can if you keep bothering us and so on. So there's some governance issues that that poses. But the fundamental issue it poses is that of the legitimacy of the European Union. The fundamental challenge it poses is, for me, I'm an American citizen, I'm also a German citizen, to ask why as a German citizen should I be sharing my sovereignty with these aspiring dictators. Um, and that, I think, is a problem that the EU has not dealt with and may not be set up to deal with. I don't see how it can deal with it, and that worries me as somebody who sees the value of, of the European Union and of these institutions. And then perhaps more broadly, this is my 60-second attempt at a Hegelian synthesis. Um, and uh, it may be less insightful than Hegel, but I hope it'll be easier to understand um, for anybody who's tried to read Hegel. Um, you know, for the last six or seven years, I've sort of been put into this role of explainer of populism. And one of the questions people always have is, where are we at with this? And early on, it was, you know, is it a populist wave or is this a long-lasting trend? And, you know, whenever populists didn't win some election, I was asked, you know, has the wave crested? Is populism over? Um, now, uh, you know, actually the conventional wisdom has flipped, and so the assumption now is that every democracy is going to collapse, and, you know, the United States already is on the way to fascism, and Italy is no longer a democracy, and so on and so forth. So I think the conventional wisdom has gone from being overly complacent about democracy in some ways to being overly fatalistic about our inability to defend democracies. But the truth of it is... Uh, that populism can't rise much further because it's already in power in so many different countries, that democracies haven't rolled over, that they have been able to defend their institutions in the United States, although they continue to be very embattled, that they may be able to defend them in Brazil, that, as Carolina was saying, despite the best attempts of the government to undermine democracy in Poland, 
uh, civil society and the opposition have done a good job with some assistance from the European Union um, at, at defending their institutions. And so I think that's just the new normal. The new normal is that democracy is going to be embattled in a whole set of different countries at a time. The members of that set of countries is going to keep changing. There'll be periods when Greece looks great and periods when we have to worry about Greece and periods when Italy looks really worrying and periods when we'll think Italy is okay right now. Uh, and we have to think about how international institutions respond to that with the relevant reforms. We have to think about how political institutions can be fortified against those attempts to undermine them. And we have to think about how all of us as citizens and writers and activists and institutional uh, shareholders, um, stakeholders, uh, deal with that. Deal with that marathon of defending democracy and democratic values at a time when we can never take them for granted. Um, and when I think, you know, for much of our lifetime, we will not be able to go back to that complacency and that lack of imagination with which many of us grew up. Great. Thank you. I shall now always think of you as Cassandra in blue jeans. <laughs> Thankfully, this lovely table hides my blue jeans. That's right. I do, we're very much running out of time, unfortunately, but I, I want to come back to you, Madame Jourova, with the question, in a way raised by Carlina, the Ukraine war has pulled Europe together. It's also, in a way, pulled it apart. There's a lot of annoyance in France, Germany, other places at the aggressive stance of Poland and the Baltic states. At the same time, Poland's generosity with Ukrainian refugees and its aid to Ukraine, which has been going on quite seriously, a big part of GDP, has in a way given Poland cover for some of its other sins. Is that true? Is that what's happening? Is that the mood now? I mean, is there more protection? Are, is the commission backing off a bit on Poland because of its solidarity with Ukraine? And I think, answer as you like, say what you like, and then we'll have to end the panel. So over to you, madam. The uh, position of Poland, everything Polish people are doing now during the Ukrainian war is amazing, is incredible. It's a fantastic story of humanity. And we fully recognize that. And I believe we are also helping Poland in this, in this difficult endeavor. How many refugees are there? Four million? Four million. At this moment, we have in Czechia 400,000. 10% of society. So oh. it's, uh, yes, uh, it's, it's very high number. But uh, it, it is not uh, the reason why we should drop insisting on, on the uh, rule of law as a principle, because if we stop uh, uh, watching uh, whether the country respects the principle of rule of law or not, I think it would be partly also Putin's victory, because he wants us to erode the system of democracy in all our member states, or at least in, in some which are more, more uh, let's say, uh, vulnerable. And uh, you are right that this, this war is a moment in history uh, which will either put us all more together, or, and I don't believe that second version, will divide us. Up to now, I call it the big meeting because suddenly the West started to listen to the East. And as, as Carolina said, it, it's funny, I wanted to avoid uh, the, 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 the issue of ideology, and you threw here the identity, which is even more difficult thing, because when you start to speak about identity, then, then normally a reasonable discussion uh, is, is in trouble. But uh, as for the identity, and I think that uh, this is also the case of Czechs and other, uh, other Eastern European countries, we simply do not want to be just imperfect copy of the West. We are bringing something new and we are bringing something very strong. And this is now the moment when we are showing that, that we perhaps understand better 
uh, what's happening now, and we understand that we must be much tougher and much more resilient in the EU, that we must stop underestimating the, the threat from, from the East. And uh, the very simplified observation I have now where we are, uh, for instance, in the question whether to accept the Russian tourists or not. We see different positions of different member states, and I see a very simple division according to which country experienced the boots of Russian soldiers on that territory and which country didn't. And I would wish those who do not have that experience, the countries of the West, to be uh, more listening to us who experience that. My first memory in life is the Russian tank in my street in 1968. So I know what I speak about. Thank you very much, because I, I think part of the tension underneath... <laughs> sorry. I mean, part of the tension underneath has always been countries that regained their sovereignty in 89, have always been a little bit reluctant to share it in the way founding members of the European Union decided to share it out of a very different experience of a very different war. May I, may I have one more question? Yes, please, go ahead. I would not be able to fall asleep, uh, which, which I am not going to do now, but <laughs> later today. On sovereignty, uh, I, I explained thousands of times that by... Uh, Mm. giving up part of the national uh, sovereignty, you are gaining a big portion of European sovereignty. And now look an, at Hungary. Hungary is a relatively small country, a relatively small number of people with relevant influence uh, in European Union. Look now at the influence Hungary has when blocking the decisions of all the others. What portion of new sovereignty the country gained? So j just imagine. So I am really, sorry, fed up of the, the, uh, all, those, uh, all those talks about losing sovereignty because by joining the EU, you are becoming much, much more stronger as also the nation. Well, just yes, please. And then, and then, really, the last word is yours. Thank you so much, okay. Stephen. At the same time, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I just was thinking, what if we look at the populist um, time as an episode on our way to uh, build European democracy? What if we look at populism, also populism in Poland, and that's why we will make Poland so relevant, as the case study of how liberal democracy is to reinvent itself around certain fundamental values. I think it gives hope, not naive optimism, but some hope. Let's end there. Thank you very much.